right. All right, so welcome to the talk. Um, the much anticipated, the one you've all been waiting for, the reason you're in Vegas. Uh, to hear how to leave Vegas uh, and go do whatever you want. Um, so this is my co-presenter, Taylor Banks, son Bo Woods, and we've both pretty much made the last couple of years about uh, getting out, traveling the world, becoming independent of location as well as uh, some income. And thank you for being in our talk instead of the other two or three talks that are going on at this very moment. Yeah. So <clears throat> why might you want to GTFO at GW? Um, probably lots of reasons. Uh, for, for Taylor and I, we each had our own, which you'll hear about. Um, the question is, can you do it? Can you reasonably do it? You probably don't think you can, or maybe you do, and you want to hear like how we've done it, which is cool. But we hope to show you at the end of this how we did it, uh, and how you can probably do it too. You've probably got more ideas than we do on some of this, uh, the group collective. Uh, you'll hear what worked for us. As um, well as what didn't. As well as what didn't. The face palm wall moments. Uh, and we'll also tell you about a framework we've come up with that we call the Advanced Persistent Traveler. Um, because you've got to have a three-letter acronym if you're going to present in Vegas and be taken seriously. We've been told by security companies who pay money to play. We didn't think the ABT acronym was used enough. So. No, no. Uh, so, so, and I'll, I'll jump straight in. So yeah, I'm Taylor Banks, and I guess I'll come over here and do on camera since we're recording. Um, I'm Taylor Banks, and the, the short introduction, the short version of my story uh, is that essentially two years ago, I basically stopped doing the work that I had been doing before. I stopped doing consulting. I stopped doing training. I launched an e-commerce site on a whim. Um, fast forward to today, that e-commerce site, despite uh, my expectations to the contrary, is now doing rather well. In fact, I would say, uh, without getting into revenue numbers, it's doing well enough uh, that it can easily sustain a lifestyle in Costa Rica pretty much entirely on its own. And fast forward to a week ago, my wife and I went out and bought a motorhome in cash and are putting our house on the market to begin the process of going anywhere and everywhere. So as we go through the, uh, the next several slides, as Bo and I kind of talk through some of the stories and talk through what we've done, I'll, I'll kind of explain how this process uh, came about and, uh, and some of the, I guess, the steps along the way that were the, uh, the tricky steps for us and, and how, we, how we made this happen. So Taylor, what's the name of your e-commerce site? So the e-commerce site that I run, Bo, is called Ace Hackware. Gotcha. For those of you that haven't heard of it. <laughs> uh, so I'm Bo Woods, and uh, a few years ago, um, I kind of got back to my regular life after having traveled around the world, and took about three months off, went through uh, China, Tibet, Mongolia, Russia, you know, got shaken down by the Russian mob a couple of times when I was traveling, uh, lived in a yurt for a couple of nights and, and drank Mongolian vodka. Um, I realized that that was awesome, but the basement office that I was in without a window kind of sucked. So I was thinking, how could I do the awesome and less of the suck? Um, <laughs> so what I really needed to do was, was figure that out. To, to come up with a plan so I could enjoy my life, to do something where I could travel around full time, which is what I wanted to do, not have to worry about money, not have to worry about the other things that were getting in my way of, of GTFO. Um, so fast forward to today, and I'm traveling around the world. In the last 12 months, I've lived in several different places, uh, Armenia, London, um, Korea, spent a month in um, Mexico City, spent a couple of weeks in Nicaragua, uh, and it's really pretty cool. So uh, hopefully you'll learn how to, how to do whatever it is you want to do from our talk. So there are a whole bunch of reasons that we have personally uh, seen as kind of the, the main motivations for us to do this. And, uh, presumably some of you have some of the same ideas in mind. Uh, you know, we've, we've kind of gone back and forth. And, and as you'll see as we go through the, the next 35, 40 minutes, uh, Bo and I have actually gone about this rather differently, but I think a lot of the, the driving uh, reasons remain the same. So one that I was really keyed on, and I'm going to steal the focus from Taylor because I like that, uh, is something that a guy named Dan Pink talks about. It's called autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Right? Autonomy, kind of being your own boss, calling the, calling the, the shots. Uh, mastery is being good at what you do or feeling like you're good at what you do and improving having the challenge to keep you growing. 
grow and engage. And in purpose, what's the reason why you're doing it, right? Are you just like banging out firewall rules so that your boss doesn't yell at you? Because that's not really a purpose. That's just kind of something that somebody tells you to do. The purpose is like why you're out there doing it, why you're living what you're doing. For some people it's one thing, for some people it's another. Um, this is what I actually refer to as I'm fucking bored with my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then there's, there's also the uh, idea of living large uh, and working less. So if you go to some place like Thailand where an apartment, all the food you can eat, housekeeper, is like $1,000 a month all in, um, you don't really don't have to make that much money, right? So if you think about it, in the US, there's some people who their car payments, some people in this room, your car payments is probably $1,000 a month. Well, if you ditch that and go someplace else, you can get away with doing a lot less. So how much do you have to work to make that $1,000? especially if you can do remote work, like most of us in here can, uh, you know, hacking into, into companies, you can do from anywhere. So you can make $1,000 in a few days, and that'll allow you to live for a month. And this was, this was a big motivation for me. Uh, this, to me, is the I'm tired of working so hard uh, you know, the scenario here. Uh, I, for me, it wasn't really so much about living large, but living differently and not working as hard to do it. I mean, you know, I don't know. I imagine that many of you in the audience for this talk, uh, like Bo and I probably would have considered ourselves a couple of years ago, um, you work at least an eight hour day, and you, you go through a 40 or 50 or 60 hour week, and you may love, you may enjoy what you're doing, but you bust your ass, you work all week, and at the end of the day, you know, you've got an apartment in Buckhead, or you've got a, a house in some, you know, uh, suburban area close to Targets and Chipotle's all over the place, and you say, hmm, maybe this isn't exactly what I really signed up for working this hard so that I can be in a, a major developed uh, sprawl is not really my idea of a good time. Yeah. So there's also the kind of the apocalypse now approach, which is see the world, meet interesting people, and hack them, right? <laughs> Traveling around, for me, is a, a liberation in a lot of ways. You know, I get to see different cultures, I get to understand their perspectives, I get to live a different lifestyle. You, know, you kind of feel like the, the jet set man of international mystery, uh, James Bond, you can be anything you want. Just traveling around, having the freedom to do what you want, uh, and getting out there, living it, and using the skills that you've acquired over the last several years or a couple of decades for some of us um, to live that life. And, and, and to me, this is what I refer to as the, if I see one more fucking Chipotle, right? So this is by extension, just beyond live, live large, work less. Uh, you know, until you, until you get out and you go other places where mm -hmm. things are different, uh, not just sites and scenes, but culture and language and, and pretty much everything you're used to and everything you know, until you've done that, I don't know, you, you live a very myopic life. So it's not until you really just jump out and you start seeing places where people do things completely different than you're used to that, uh, to me, life becomes pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of people uh, that I've run across in my past 18 months or so traveling around, they've gone out because they, they had that real purpose drive, right? They started an NGO. You know, I met several people in our media who were doing an NGO in Nicaragua, you know, a couple of folks. The guys in our community, like Johnny Long, uh, he started an NGO, he's out in Africa doing his thing. Uh, and for some people, that's just what pulls them. They feel compelled to get out. The GTFO. Agreed, and I'm gonna say, I think most of the people in this room probably uh, already have some of these ideas in mind, so I'm going to fast forward as to what's holding them back. Yeah, before we do that, Let's do a game we like to play called Shirt Shots or Shots. Or shirts. <laughs> so, if you've got some motivation, and I know pretty much everybody in here does, otherwise, why would you be in this talk? Um, what is it that's driving you? Why is it you came here today? What do you want to talk about? You can come up and get either a shot of kudzu soju, which is a Korean liquor, homemade. Um, you, can, you can take it. We do check IDs, so make sure you're over 21. Or you can get a nice shirt, either a glorious Ace Hackwear shirt, or one that I've got here, uh, homosexual. <laughs> Shirt or shot, anybody have a, a specific reason or purpose or desire to get out and do something different uh, that is not addressed within our... Passion. Passion? Passion. Shirt or shot? Oh, uh, sure. Shirt. Sure. Sure. All right, so Ace Hackware, homosexual. 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 Okay. Right. You win. You win. If that's not the right size, come see me. So, so passion, uh, it, it, it expound on that just a little bit. So what do you mean? You have to follow what your heart tells you, what, what draws you. Like, what's the point of living if you're not going to follow your passion? Yeah, 
I agree completely. Yeah. So what's your passion? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> you want everything. You want it all. Yes. I definitely understand that. Awesome. So now let's move on to what is holding you back. And as I was kind of thinking about this, what was holding me back? And the people that I've talked to, what's been holding them back? And it's really, it's, it's three things that we know very, very well in this industry. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The fear of like, okay, I'm afraid that maybe I won't, won't be able to get there and have an income stream, or, or the doubt of like, look, I've got a house. What's gonna happen to my, what's gonna happen to my house? It's uncertain. Yeah. Or the flip side of that, where am I going to live, right? Okay, right. I wanna go somewhere, but I have no idea what it's like. I don't know how much it costs. I don't know which areas I'm safe to live in. And depending on where you're going, you also may ask yourself at some point in time, am I going to survive this? Am I going to be kidnapped? Am I going to be the outsider? Am I going to be hated by the locals and the, the community and the population? So there is a lot of FUD, uh, and, and I think that's one thing that uh, hopefully most in the room are at least familiar with. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too, to me, because if you look around and you talk to the people who are in this room, the security guys, we all bash FUD, right? We're not FUD merchants, we don't sell it, we're not marketing people, hopefully most of you aren't. Really cool. but, anyway, <laughs> uh, but we're still susceptible to it, so you can see how effective it really is. You know, the societal pressure, the social uh, norms that we all have in our, in our heads, just from growing up in the cultures that we've grown up in, keep us locked in this idea that we have to do this certain thing, that we have to go about it a certain way, and if you get outside of that, then all of a sudden you're in this unknown territory. There's uncertainty, there's fear, you doubt yourself. So, then how do you get over that? I think that there's three key elements to this. I think confidence, experience, and planning. You know, you have the confidence to say, look, I've got a good skill set. I'm in an industry that's growing faster than we can hire people to fill the jobs that we have. I've got people, recruiters, calling me every single day saying, hey, do you want to leave your job and get paid a lot more? Yeah, who doesn't want to respond to that? But maybe you don't jump for one reason or another. It's also the confidence to say I'm doing the right thing. Right? Right. This is what I actually should be doing, not just the self-confidence, which is obviously very important, especially if you're gonna leave everything behind and bounce to another country or somewhere <coughs> that is completely different, but also the confidence to say this is the right move. And, and something we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more as we get further into the slides, um, you know, it, you, you, you've gotta ask yourself questions like, hey, you know, uh, what's the worst that can happen? And so these are some of the things that are going to help you build the confidence to overcome some of that fear and that uncertainty. Yeah. Experience to me is, it really helps people who are like, well, I've never traveled internationally. I can't just like jump out and go do this. No, you're right, you can. You can do little steps along the way. Like one of the things that, that I did is, I have a little hostel in Atlanta, and so I was like, well, what's it like living in a hostel for a week? So I just went and lived in the hostel in Atlanta for a week. If I needed anything, I could always drive back home, right, it's not that far. But that gave me some experience to say, okay, I can actually get through this or you can take two weeks uh, and travel around, go to some place, um, get location independent if that's what you ultimately want to do. And you don't necessarily have to tell your boss if you work from home regularly anyways. Um, so I'm not saying that I did this or I didn't do it, <laughs> but I might have gone to Oktoberfest for a couple of weeks and just worked in internet cafes, so I'm sorry about the loud audio in the background. Um, and that worked for me and I was able to pull it off and until now no about it. Uh, interestingly <laughs> as well, I mean, we live, we live in a time now where area codes don't really matter anymore. I mean, frankly, you know, half the people in the room probably have a phone number whose area code may or may not even be the place where you live. So frankly, uh, you know, when I'm doing consulting, when I'm, when I'm doing training, I get a call from a client or a customer, I pick up the phone on my phone number, they don't have any idea where I am. Uh, you know, as long as I answered the phone at a, a reasonable time during the time zone that I'm expected in, somebody's going to assume I am where I've always been, but there's no reason that I might not be in California when I am expected to be in Atlanta. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I say I go pretty much wherever there's an international airport. Right? Easy enough. Yeah. Um, and the last point is planning, right? The act of just sitting down and coming up with a plan, even a rudimentary plan, kind of deconstructing, reverse engineering, to steal some of Taylor Thunder later, <laughs> what, what you're going to have to do, like, look, Get on the internet. What's it cost to, to move to Costa Rica? Plane ticket is like 500 bucks. You, know, you can rent a house for like 500 bucks a month. Somebody delivers you groceries for like 20 bucks a week, okay? That's not much. Now that you've got that knowledge, you started doing some of the planning, 
it's more about how do I get myself out of where I am today than it is how do I get myself into the next thing. And I think that those three things, confidence, experience, and planning, helps you overcome the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And this is where I think you're also going to see a little bit of a different, you can hit the next slide, but you're going to see a little bit of a different in, in mindset as Bo and I approach this. You know, one of the things uh, that you, you may have gotten from our, our intros, but you'll certainly get as we tell a little bit more of our stories in a few minutes, is that Bo and I have actually approached this process very differently. And it's funny because, you know, we put together this list of fears, uncertainty, and doubt. So this FUD column on the left-hand side, we put together, um, you know, together, but as we did it, it, you know, we looked at the structure of the fears and the structure of the, the uncertainties that we have. And it's funny, we're both thinking about things very differently. You know, Bo's fear is, I have a house, uh, what am I going to do with my house? Me, I said, sell my house. I don't give a shit that I've got a house. Like, to me, I have no fear or uncertainty about having a house. My fear is, where the hell am I going to live? Where am I going to, am I going to get an apartment? Am I going to buy a house? Am I going to stay in somebody's room? So it's funny, as we approached these challenges, we realized that we both had very different mindsets and we focused on different sides of the same coin or different sides of the same problem. And I think that was, it's also evident in the path we took. Uh, I think Bo, you know, arguably is a bit more of a planner than me. And I'm, I'm a bit more of a reverse engineer. So you'll see, you know, well, I don't know, more of, but my style is more reverse engineering. So that was kind of how I fell into this is I, I ended up in circumstances and I said, wow, holy shit, this is where I want to be how do I work backwards from here, right? I didn't really start with a plan. I started with ending up the place I wanted to be and realized, wait a second, why am I not here all the time? Yeah. So, but in all the cases, I mean, I think ultimately, and we hit on a couple of these in the previous slide, pretty much every fear, every uncertainty, and every doubt that we've encountered, we've also conquered, or we've at least addressed. We've at least managed to convince ourselves that it, it's a, you know, either limited importance or it's something to which we'll find the solution, right? Yeah. A lot of these things, you know, the decisions you make about where you want to go, or what you want to do, or how you want to GTFO FTW, they make these problems not exist anymore, which is kind of a, a cool approach when you, when you start doing it and you find that. So this is our advanced persistent travel. Um, again, the theoretical framework that we came up with, just kind of back of the napkin sketch of like, what is it that you need to be able to do to get out and to do this? So we came up with three primary elements. And you can see why we, we relate this to advanced persistent travel, the APT, because it's kind of like a reverse advanced persistent threat. And if you're playing buzzword bingo, there you go, you can drink that. <laughs> but the first step is really to exfiltrate. It's what would normally be the last step, right? Yeah. We're describing kind of a more typical uh, you know, APT. But, but in, in our case, that was the first step, the, the hard part, and really, Frankly, as I'll point out, you know, this presentation today, if you guys like our presentation, please let us know, but this presentation today is really about fastest path to exfiltration. Yeah. Um, you know, we, this was, this was the, the first and the hardest step for us, is getting to the point where we could say, I'm free of all of the things that hold me back. Yeah. So, but, but again, as you see, you know, this is kind of, it, it turns the model on its head. Yeah, and so for me, my exfiltrate was getting out of the country, like becoming location independent. For Taylor, it was becoming career. Right. So getting out of the job. I, you know, I mean, admittedly, I worked for myself before, I work for myself now, but I worked for myself before spending 60 hours a week doing you know, expensive consulting and high-end training, and now I don't. Now I spend five hours a week pushing buttons and running reports from an e-commerce site. So, so you know, as Bo pointed out, you know, his, his process was to get the hell out of the, the country, the location. Mine was to get the hell out of the circumstances that were holding me back. And the interesting thing is, is despite that pretty distinct difference in our approach, the model that we've kind of applied to this, we think applies pretty well to, to both of our, our methods. Yeah. Then the second step of persist is like, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it to keep this thing rolling? So in my case, location independence, I would take small projects that may be you know, a month long, but they would, they would pay me enough because I was working like eight to 10 hour days, just like you normally do in, in this industry, for like a month. And then I could live for like two or three months. And I didn't have to worry about money. So I could just do whatever I wanted during that time. I could hang out, I could travel around a little bit. I could uh, enhance my location independence even more. I could plan for the next job. Um, whereas Taylor, 
it, for me, it's been more about um, about taking that fledgling e-commerce site that you know initially started out as uh, a domain name and some Amazon arbitrage, right? What do people want to buy? Oh shit, somebody bought one. I better use my Amazon Prime to ship it to me so I can turn it back around out the door fast enough, <laughs> right? And, and moving from there to wait, how do I grow a customer base? How do I market what it is I'm selling? How do I build a profitable business around actually doing this? And and I'll touch on that a little bit more because for me, I mean, it was mostly, it was more about attitude and, and indeed persistence. I mean, I, I had to, I had to continuously tell myself, okay, these, you know, the growth I'm seeing is very small and very slow, but the fact that I'm seeing growth is enough to inspire me to believe that if I continue to do this and I learn more about what I'm doing, then maybe I can pull this off and maybe within some reasonable time frame, this might actually be in a place where it's going to pay my bills and allow me to go be where I want to be without having to work a 40, 50, 60 hour work week. Yeah. And so then the last step in this theoretical framework, and I'll admit this is something we came up with in the last two or three weeks, uh, but it seems to work. And so this is, this, is, this is the last step right now, but we're still in the process, right? We haven't figured it all out. So as we go along, we might find that there's more steps after this. But the final step that we've got here is to expand. Right? Now that we are somewhere else, and we figure out how we can make sure that we stay here, how do we move to other places, right? How do I jump from one country to another country, or how do I get into another business line so that I don't have to work quite as much, do more e-tailing uh, or whatever? Um, how can I expand my purview, you know, get more familiar with the people that I'm hanging out with, with the expats in the community, travel around the region, you know, whatever it is that, that I prefer to do, um, how can you expand on that and make it more of what you do for real? And, and the interesting thing too is, you know, I, I think as you'll see, our, our efforts to persist and move into expansion have also, I, I think, our paths have gone places that we might not have expected them to. And you'll, you'll hear a bit about this from me now as we kind of step into the next slide. I'll tell you about the, you know, how this started for me and then I'll fast forward to where I am today, which is not where I expected to be but it's a hell of a lot closer to where I thought I would be two years ago when I sat down and conceived of this wild notion that I didn't want to work so hard to, to live in a house in Atlanta. Yeah. So, you know, it's something that just occurred to me. It's kind of neat that what I'm talking about is expanding, mm -hmm. is what you were doing is persisting, sure. vice versa. Sure. You're getting ready to go to Costa Rica, which yeah. is my persist. Sure. And that's your expansion. Exactly. So, exactly. we learn a lot from each other. So, and I'll trade places with you, yeah. Um, so in essence, what we've done is, is we both have kind of taken our stories and broken them down. And we tried to approach this um, from the perspective that there are basically four pieces to this. Uh, we each had a goal in mind. We each had a problem uh, that we were trying to solve. We ended up finding a, a, a solution, and then there was ultimately a resolution for that. So I'll, I'll tell you my story a little bit, and I'll keep it brief, but I'm gonna go into enough detail because I think in essence, this was my epiphany, this was my aha moment. Um, so I actually credit a good friend of mine who's in the room here today, a couple of years ago, basically invited me on a literally spur of the moment notice to join him in Costa Rica. Uh, it was, uh, in case anybody who pays my expense reports is watching, uh, ostensibly a business trip. Um, so we, we end up in Costa Rica. It was. Yeah, indeed. It was, it's cheaper to meet there and do business than it is to... And it actually was, uh, thanks to Spirit Airlines, who I will also never fly again. But nonetheless, uh, <laughs> nonetheless, it was actually cheaper for us both to leave our homes and go to Costa Rica than it would have been to have worked from either of our own locations or a third party location, the, the customer for whom we were doing this job. So we ended up down in Costa Rica, and, and actually it, the, the setting couldn't have been more perfect the first time around. We go down, uh, my wife goes along with me, and we are literally in one of the most remote parts of Costa Rica. We're, we're all the way down on the bottom, uh, the southwest tip of the Guanacaste Peninsula. Uh, we're pretty far remote. We're like two hours from the nearest airport. You basically have to have a four-wheel drive vehicle to get to where we're going. Uh, the place we're staying in, the cabina has no TV, not just no cable, there's no TV, there's no telephone. There is literally air conditioning and actually, uh, much to my uh, satisfaction, there was good Wi-Fi. But the bottom line, though, it was, it, it was very, very remote. Uh, we, we had nothing but you know, fresh fruit, fresh food every day. We were 50 yards from the beach. We had hammocks, and we had good Wi-Fi. And it was literally everything that I could have wanted to, to have and be. I was like, holy cow, why am I not doing this every day? <laughs> so 
as I'm, as I'm going through this, we spend a, a week or however many days in Costa Rica. We, we, we actually get done the work that we set out to get done in addition to spending some time in the water and, and hiking around in the, the jungles nearby. And I started to work backwards. I said, okay, what is my goal? My goal is to live a life in Costa Rica. I want to be here. I want to live in a place where I don't care if there's a TV, where I don't want a telephone. I want to live in a place where I'm 50 yards from the beach. I've got a nice hammock. There's cool colored crabs running around everywhere and there's a good Wi-Fi connection. To me, that is my picture of paradise. So what's the problem? Now, in my mind, the problem was the cost. How can I afford to do this? I've got all of these things in Atlanta. Am I gonna be able to make enough money? What will I do if I move to Costa Rica? How am I gonna pay for this lifestyle? And so this is where my process began. I didn't really start by planning. I started by working backwards. And I said, wait a second, how much does it cost to live here? And so Mark and I have a conversation, and Mark goes and he finds a couple of websites, and he shows me a couple of links, and he says, well, you know, it, it's pretty reasonable. You can find a fully furnished house within a block from the beach, all utilities, satellite TV, and internet, well, for between about three to six hundred dollars a month. Mind-boggling. Three to six hundred dollars a month, and I've got a place one block from the beach. I've got internet, utilities, and satellite TV included, and it's a furnished place, so I don't even have to bring my stuff. I can show up with nothing but the clothes on my back. So now all of a sudden, my, my, my mind starts to shift and I realize what I thought was the problem, which was how can I afford to live here, is not really the problem at all. The solution, in fact, is in essence, and this may kind of sound ridiculous, but how can I try to make less money and work less in order to make only the money that I'm going to need to make to live in this place? Because if I'm gonna bust my ass and work 60 hours a week, What's the point of being in a place like this southern tip of the Guanacaste Peninsula in Costa Rica with no TV and no telephone? It doesn't make sense. So I began to go through this reverse engineering process. Okay, how much does it cost for a place by the beach? I can be within a block from the beach. It's going to cost me, let's just say, 500 bucks a month, right? I'm going to have to get transportation in Costa Rica because that's the one thing. The roads are pretty bad. I'm not going to take a car. The import duties on a car are pretty high. So actually renting or purchasing a vehicle in Costa Rica is a little bit more expensive than a comparable vehicle in the US. So I'm gonna spend a couple thousand dollars to get you know, a, a pretty old, pretty funky Jeep or a dirt bike. All right, so I'm gonna spend a couple thousand dollars. Eating is pretty cheap. I don't know if you guys have been to Costa Rica, but you know, if you're in the right places, you can eat a really good meal for about six bucks, right? Six bucks for meat, veggies, rice, beans, a very satisfying meal, and probably less, especially in more remote areas, and if you speak good Spanish. So as I begin to go through this process, I'm realizing this isn't going to cost me nearly what I thought it would, and in fact, living the lifestyle that I actually think of as the dream lifestyle is probably going to cost me at most 20% of the lifestyle that I work to attain, that I bust my ass to live and attain in the United States, in Atlanta, Georgia today. So ultimately, I realize that this is attainable and I'm going to do it. Now, admittedly, fast forward, you know, two years later, I don't live in Costa Rica yet. Um, I, I've been a few times, and in fact, that was ultimately the resolution here, is I realized, okay, I'm not going to move overnight. I do have a house. I do have, you know, roots in Atlanta. I've got friends. I've got family. Some of the things that we had on our FUD slide. But my resolution is, okay, it costs $300 to fly from Atlanta to Costa Rica with one stop. I'm going to do this two or three or five times a year until I figure out where I want to live, how much it's going to cost, and, and basically where I'm going to plant my roots. And so the process began. So I get back home to Atlanta and I say, how am I going to pay for this? And enter a sackware. I decide I'm going to build an e-commerce shop to sell toys to all of the folks who are in the same profession I'm in, right? We're all some, uh, some extension of a, a pen tester, a security engineer, uh, you know, a gadget fan, and I say, why can't I bring all of these things together and sell pen test drop boxes, lock picks, bump keys, handcuffs, spy cameras, right? Every tool you wanted as a security engineer, as a security consultant, as a pen tester, I'm going to bring it together in one place. And as I said, ultimately, um, it was kind of a long process in the making. In the early days, Ace Hackware began as a domain name, a, a Shopify e-commerce site and a bit of a creative Amazon arbitrage. I had a couple of products that I bought and kept inventory in, but I literally a couple of products and only a few pieces. 
And so in the early days, I would go find something that I thought was cool, I'd slap it up on my e-commerce site, and if somebody bought it, I would turn around, ship it to me overnight, repackage it, slap my sticker on it, stick a, a packing list in the box, and send it to my customer, and I quickly realized this was sustainable. Now again, fast forward two years, um, Ace Hackware, I won't say it runs itself, because it does require four to six hours of my babysitting every week, but I have one full-time employee who does most of the work. My fulfillment process has been largely outsourced, but I do maintain inventory for everything I sell. Um, we've actually got a few products that are ours that we've created and that, that only we have. And as I said, at this point in time, Ace Hackware supports this lifestyle. So on you know, six hours a week, I now have enough income to basically go do this with zero changes. Now I'm not there, but as I said at the beginning, at this point in time, a week ago, I basically went out, bought a 34-foot motorhome in cash on the barrel head, and I am hopefully somewhere between 30 and 45 days from having my house basically sold and beginning to move slowly or quickly from Atlanta, Georgia to somewhere along the Guanacaste Peninsula or who knows where um, nearby. And so there's my story, right? Uh, I, again, what I, what I set out to do, what I thought I could never afford to do, what I thought, you know, I had this illusion in my mind and this doubt that I was going to be able to go live a life uh, in a, a house a block from the beach because of what I thought was a cost issue turned out to be really none of the above. It was some kind of preconceived notion I had, some inhibition that didn't really exist. And frankly, all I had to do to figure that out was to, to work backwards, play a little bit of a numbers game in a process that took me maybe five minutes, and end up at the conclusion that this wasn't really that hard. So if you look at this as kind of a three or four phrase, phase process for me, I basically did a proof of concept. I went to Costa Rica and said, oh, yep, this is what I want to be doing. I reverse engineered it. I said, all right, how do I get here? How much is this going to cost? And what am I going to have to do to get to this place? I deconstructed it and said, okay, I know how much money it's going to make. How can I do something that will allow me to make just that much money and not have to work any harder in order to make any more than that? And then ultimately to start, to, to get a domain, to slap up an e-commerce site and say, let's do this thing. So my process was a little bit different, you know, I, as I said, I, I just got back from three months of traveling around the world and I was stuck in a basement office, like, the ceiling didn't leak, but it, all, it was almost like a stereotypical leaky ceiling, no windows, like a, like a prison cell you would see, uh, and I really felt trapped. But I was saying to myself, you know, I really enjoyed what I was doing before, how can I do that more, do more of that, and become location independent, and just like travel around, right? Like, this is Everest, Mount Everest right up there. I was there. I didn't climb the top of it, but I ran up a little hill and you know, ran out of breath and then rolled back down. <laughs> Moscow at night, gorgeous city. I highly recommend you go if you can and you know, try and avoid the, the Russian mafia. Um, that's the Potala Palace in, in Lhasa. That's where the Dalai Lama would be if the Chinese over there weren't like, keeping him out. So. Like those are the things that I accomplished in three months. The things that I saw, the, the stuff that I thought, you know, I could probably never do if I took all of my life, but I did, and it was really easy, it was pretty cheap too. Um, so how do I get there from where I am today? This is like six years ago, seven years ago maybe. I had just started my InfoSec career. So I had like a year, maybe two. I didn't have the skill set. I didn't know anybody other than my boss, and you know, she couldn't really help me go there again. So I said, what do I need to do to achieve this? You know, the breakthrough moment was, I can do that. It's not going to cost, you know, 60, 80, 100 thousand dollars. I don't have to wait until I'm 70 and I retire, and then I go on a cruise ship with all the old Brinkley people. Like, that's not what I want to do at all. So how can I live the retirement lifestyle that I want to live now, but still afford it? Uh, and, and so I figured I could travel the world doing security stuff and pay for it. So how do I get there? Well, it turns out I already had a lot of the skills and a lot of the things that I needed. For instance, uh, I already had the passion for security. You know, I loved doing stuff. I was getting more and more technical, and I could, I could you know, pop a box with Metasploit, which back in the day wasn't as easy as it is now. I think they've got like a graphical <laughs> interface, and I don't know. But back then, it was like you had to know the, the 
metasploit food to be able to do it. I was proud of myself. That was like the bar that I was at to give you some context of how rudimentary my skills were when I decided to do this. So I need to get more skills, right? Obviously, no brain. I also need to meet more people to build that uh, business network, to, to make those connections where if I needed work, I could call somebody up and say, hey man, you got anything you can throw my way because I'm starving over here in Bulgaria or whatever. Um, so being able to make those connections was also really important. I wanted to be able to travel while I was doing it. So you know, how do I travel and do computer stuff and make connections? Well, the natural thing was just to become a consultant, right? So I had some technical skills, I had some business skills, I had the uh, good fortune of running into a good job doing travel and consulting where you know I was the guy who was like, I never want to come home. I want to get rid of my house right now. If you could just put me on a plane and fly me around every single week to a different spot, like that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so I did that, I built my skills. Every time I went on a gig, I challenged myself. Like, make sure you take care of all the stuff the customer wants, and then give them a little bit extra, right? Plan an extra day in there where you're supposed to be traveling, but you can take it, hey, you, you got these voice phones, I, I noticed that they're running on VoIP, and that's a pretty new installation. Have you had anybody test it? Well, how about if I do that for you? You know, I'm, I've got some uh, VoIP testing equipment in my bag. No, I don't know, it's like a laptop. Everybody's going to say, <laughs> right. Why don't I just run a few simple tests? You know, no big deal. And that way you'll at least have some assurance that you, then you go out to the VoIP testing websites and like look up how to do it and run this and download those tools. Like they're not asking me to do it for money. They're not paying me extra to do this. It's just something I'm doing voluntarily. Now it benefits the customer. It benefits me uh, by, by doing my skill sets as well as by they like me a lot now. So that's how I decided to do it. Uh, fast forward a couple of years and I went into more of the business side of it, which taught me a lot about running a business. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't know business stuff. Uh, fast forward a couple of years after that and uh, I, I was able to branch out. I went out, lived in Armenia for six months, uh, traveled around the world. I was able, able to enable that lifestyle through the connections that I had made, through the skills that I had developed. Um, so I thought that that was uh, just incredible. I'm still kind of in awe that I was able to pull it off when I really didn't think I could. But you know, confidence, uh, uh, planning, and experience allowed me to do it. So, if you break mine down into kind of a four-step, it would be like assess, plan, and then then go. Right? Go execute on that plan. That's three. Yeah. Well, I'm not done. All right. Uh, and then figure out everything else later, yeah. right? So there's a lot of stuff you can do when you think you're going to fail um, and you actually end up succeeding. So for about the first six months, I couldn't get any work because I didn't have the right paperwork in place with the right companies to be able to have them actually sign a contract with me and pay me. That process was really, really painful. But I got through it. You know, I didn't expect that, but luckily I was able to get through it living in a place that's fairly cheap. Uh, and so you know, I can tell you, if you, if you want to get uh, contracted with a company, come see me. I can tell you all the like, little ways that you have to do it, the things you have to put in place. Um, so that was, that was my four-step process. I, I also, as you were talking through this, I think this is something that you and I discussed, and I don't think it found its way into our slides, but I think that it's also kind of another important distinction between the way that Bo and I approach this because uh, again, we've, we've had very different um, desires. But for me, you know, I, I've basically created a circumstance where I, I work a little bit either every day or every week. You know, every day I probably spend an hour you know, looking at the site, going through a report, pulling some data, tweaking something in my accounting. So I spend a little bit of time each day or each week. I'll take a couple of days off and make it up on the weekend. But I spend a little time each day or each week doing what I'm doing in order to enable the business that enables the lifestyle I want. Whereas Bo, I think in contrast, he'll spend a few weeks at a time or a, a, a few months, I guess, on a long project working the way that he's been working before. Working every day, you know, uh, approaching a project, nine to five or whatever the customer requires, and he'll do that for a month or two in order to accumulate a pile of money, and then he'll go take a month or two off and not work at all presumably, during that, that couple of months that he's now traveling. And the cool thing is, neither is right, neither is wrong. They both work. Um, what Bo's been doing has been working very well for him, and he's been bouncing all over the place. And simultaneously, what I've been doing 
has allowed me to do a lot of things that I couldn't do and wouldn't have been able to do when I was working 40, 50, 60 hours every week. So two very different approaches, but at the same time, it, it really kind of satisfied that same goal, which was to, to really change what we were doing and how we were doing it. Yeah. So uh, as Taylor mentioned, this is two different ways, but that doesn't mean that those are the only two ways to go. So uh, a couple of our friends have got some stories that we'll, we'll tell really quickly. Uh, we know one guy who's on the, the local DC mailing, DEF CON mailing list. Um, and he decided he was just gonna pick up and go for a couple of weeks and like fix routers at a Buddhist monastery in Nepal. And I think they, awesome. Yeah, like they paid his way to go out there and used his skill and just went and did it. And that's super cool. Yeah. You know. Um, Similarly, and, and this is something that actually the wife and I, when my stepson was basically considering going into the Navy and we were trying to figure out how to convince him that there were other things he could do, um, Beth discovered that there is a, an organization, I believe they're up in Maine, where I can literally go up and they will teach you to build boats. They will teach you to hand carve large wooden yachts and they will give you room and board while you help them build boats because you are basically working for them throughout that process. So you basically go up and you live for free while you learn to build wooden yachts. To me, that is mind-bogglingly cool. Um, we didn't do that, but the fact that that exists, the fact that you can say, I don't want to do what I'm doing anymore and all I gotta do is come up with the money to live and there is, there is somewhere where you can go that they will give you a place to live and teach you a trade and all you have to do in exchange is do that trade that you are being taught. I think that's amazing. And, and I, until we started on that process, until we started trying to find you know, what can we do to give Jim some other options, I wouldn't have believed that that existed. Yeah. So, so time now again for a favorite game. Schurter shot. Schurter shot. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's probably, that's a good question, the answer to which will probably be something we will explore more in the persist and expand phases of this yeah. conversation. I mean, I think right now we both have and or have been able to be within the healthcare system that, you know, either have insurance for or within or we haven't encountered issues with healthcare yet in the way we're going about this, although I know this is a topic that is explored in detail in and amongst the expat community, which I think we've both spent a fair bit of time poking around and exploring and researching because you know, that community is in many regards the community that we are kind of entering into. We are becoming world travelers. I, I met two people earlier in this week who when we got into conversation, I asked them where they lived, they said, we're full-time travelers, right? And that's, that's the, the pitch. They don't have a house. They've got, you know, a van or a boat or they house sit or they dog sit or they couch surf or whatever the case. And so I know that's something that we will inevitably encounter. But at least for me, it hasn't been an issue yet. Yeah. Anybody got a story about, like, where they just went out and did something crazy for a week or something? They didn't think they'd be able to, yeah? Uh... Well, not a week or something, but what I've been doing the last six years is traveling for my company, and I've done 14 countries, 19 states. And I, they pay me crap tons of money and pay my, and I have health care, right. and I spend three weeks in Bosnia. Yeah, so exactly. Like, exactly. So. Short or shot? Uh, I'm an alcoholic, so shot. Shot. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Come up afterwards and we'll, no, we'll no, 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 no. Uh, with either one of those. So I uh, wanted to move into a couple of quick pro tips uh, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, so the first one is have an opportunity radar, right? You're out doing these things, you might have an opportunity to meet somebody cool, like they might be the next guy sitting over next to you. Maybe they run a, a, a company and they need some IT help or some security help or whatever. You may be out at a coffee shop and like the Wi-Fi is blanking so you go to the, the coffee shop owner, you're like, hey, you want me to help fix your Wi-Fi and you just give me a month of free coffee? Right, barter. Right? Yeah, so exactly. It's, it's about having a, you know, the, 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 the eyes to see opportunities where they exist. Yeah. Like say. And you may run into just an opportunity where somebody's like, oh yeah, I've got this IT company and I need somebody to do security for me. Can you do that? It's like a, you know, some companies uh, out there just need a security guy like a week a month. 
So maybe you could do a week a month where you're their security guy, and then the rest of the time you're doing something else. And, and maybe, maybe that week a month is enough to enable whatever you want to do. Maybe it's not even about security. I mean, who knows? It's, it's whatever you, you see that, that really falls within your wheelhouse. I mean, frankly, now it's like my radar is tuned a little bit differently. I've been in security for 15 years, but at the same time, I'm somewhere, and I hear someone say, oh, I've got a shop, and oh, I wish I could set up an e-commerce shop. And, Ding, 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 ding. All right, hey, I know how to do that. I've done, I've done that from scratch and learned a whole shitload of ways to do it wrong in the past two years. So I can probably show you how to not do it wrong the same way I've done it. Yeah. Um, and again, it's basically just about kind of shifting your focus. Those are the types of things where two years ago, if I was traveling and sitting in a coffee shop and I heard somebody wishing they could have started an e-commerce shop, I probably would have gotten up and moved to a different seat. <laughs> right? So, but now instead, I'm actually going to engage that person in a conversation and say, hey, you know what? Um, the right opportunity, the right circumstances, let's chat, maybe I can help you out with that. Yeah. So, um, another one is your gear really matters when you're traveling full time. So, one of the first travels that I had internationally, I went to Barcelona and I was going from a plane to a boat and I was running down the, the streets of, of Barcelona, Los Ramos, with this stupid roller bag and the wheel busted and if you've ever been on rock, the, the streets of Spain, they're all cobbly and, and bumpy. And long story short, I didn't make my boat. So I had to go back to the airport, again, dragging this bag that was now an anchor. Uh, and finally I got there, I got a flight and, and made it across. So roller bags suck, bring backpacks. Backpacks are easy to carry, you know, you can put them somewhere. If you need rollers, most places you go where you would need the rollers, have a roller for you. Um, over the shoulder bags work well too. I actually have a really good uh, over the shoulder bag that you know basically just kind of hangs on my side. And frankly, you know there are a couple of additional benefits. Number one, um, running through an airport with a roller bag is uh, very dangerous both to you and everyone around you, and likely someone will fall. Yeah. Running through an airport with a bag that's securely strapped over your shoulder, well, you might bump into somebody, but you're not as likely to fall. Uh, but the other thing too, you know, depending on how much you're able to get rid of your stuff. Roller bags, they add like 20% weight and reduce the capacity of your bag by like 20% or more because of the ridiculous frames and the stupid little wheels that they put these things anyway. So yeah. get it over the shoulder bag or backpack and you'll, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble when you're actually spending time on the road. Yeah, and does anybody have a gear bag that looks like that? Like all full of <laughs> wires and dongles and like all the things that you think you need to... Right. That's not really compatible with the travel everywhere and carry everything on your back lifestyle. I mean, I did that for a long time too. And it sucked. And I had this big bag of stuff that was heavy, and I carried it around, and I ended up only using it like one out of every five gigs. So what I realized is that there's shortcuts you can take. Like one of my secrets, uh, I'll tell you real quickly, is when you go in and do a wireless pin test, right? You do the war drive, and you walk around, and you get all the wireless access points, and you go to the guy and you say, "Hey, look, you know, I could sit here and spend the next two days trying to crack your Wi-Fi password, but you're not going to get as much value out of that as if you just like." Think about how strong it is, and I'll give you the rules of strength of Wi-Fi, and like you can judge it for yourself. And then let's like go to, to kind of the open box, the white box method, and say, what are the other controls you've got? Because a password isn't going to keep a bad guy out for long, right? He can spoof your Wi-Fi access point, capture an Active Directory credential, do all kinds of things. Especially if he's got a root of vague advice from Especially Yeah. Root of vague advice from <laughs> yeah, right. boy. So, so you can simplify what you're doing. <laughs> And that'll simplify your, your kit. And don't be like the guy in the right-hand picture where he's got the TV and speakers and satellite television up on his backpack and his dog's loaded down. Like, just You look like a, a dork doing that. You're not a dork in a good way. Well, and I'll, I'll admit, uh, I absolutely was the guy with the gear bag in the middle, or not that bag, but a uh, you know, variation thereof. And I actually, uh, only on my second trip to Costa Rica, did I force myself to take one bag. I decided I am not going to take a suitcase and a bag and a backpack and a laptop bag and everything else and I literally got everything that I would need for six days into a single backpack that I took with me and I, I have to admit despite the the gear gadget freak that I am and have been for a decade it was actually the most liberating experience I can't tell you what it was like to not have to wonder where my other bags were or not have to worry about all the other shit that I had everything I had literally fit into something I was carrying on my back yeah. mind-blowing and when you get to a new place try and integrate a little you're not there to sit in your hotel or your, your uh, apartment and like stare at the walls all day, right? So getting out, getting into the community, walking out of the coffee shop, meeting expats, meeting people, you know, 
grab somebody off the street or, or go to a, a restaurant or you know, put up a flyer somewhere that says, I want to learn to cook this, rest, this meal, and have somebody just come to teach you how to cook Indian food or Malaysian food or South American cuisine. Like, that's pretty awesome. Um, I've learned some really cool ways to cook stuff that uh, you know, now I can cook better. I think, I think part of it's also just about living like a local, and I, I guess I have the benefit, you know, my wife and I, as long as we've traveled, this has kind of been our travel style. We're not the, the couple that's likely to go down and stay in a fancy room at the resort hotel. We're going to find somebody's house to stay in. Um, we're not going to go and hang out on the Sheraton, one mile, you know, mixed use community. We want to go, frankly, find the seedy parts of town where the locals hang out. I want to find the restaurants where the locals eat, um, where we're not going to find other people that look like us. And I don't know, we, we learn a lot, we have a lot of fun, and it's, it's much quicker and easier to, to figure out what what the community's like when you actually immerse yourself in it, rather than sit back at a distance and, and see what you know the uh, the large hotel companies have planned out for you. Yeah. So action. What's the next action from here? You guys probably all are, are sitting on the edge of your chairs, like, all right, how do I do that? Well, as we said in the abstract, anybody that jumps on a cab from here to the airport, like, will pay the cabbie for your fare down there. Skip DEF CON, right? It's yeah. 20,000 smelly fucking people at a hacking <laughs> conference. You're not going to get into the, the talks you want to go to. The rooms are going to be full. You're going to be mad. The goons are going to yell at you. Go now! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or sit down um, someplace and do some research, right? Do some of the exercises uh, that we've got on one of the slides, and we'll make that available for you. But, like, sit down and look at what it's actually going to cost for you to get there, for you to live, for you to do something uh, a little bit different, and just get a little bit of plan. Or go, you know, check out of the, the hotel, go home, and then go live in a hostel for a week. Um, but, but kind of practice, or do an exercise that gets you more comfortable, that gives you confidence, experience, or planning so you can get over the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And, and take the big obstacles and turn them into small obstacles. I mean, for me, it's like, I don't know, I, I was amazed. I, I had this revelation when I realized all of the things I thought were pretty much wrong. When I, when I stepped back and looked and I broke it down into very small costs and very small little, you know, dipping my toe in the water, I realized it's not gonna be expensive to do what I wanna do. It's not gonna take a lot. It's gonna be pretty easy for me to generate income in my spare time to fund this. And, and like Bo said, when you go and you look it up online, and you realize, oh wait, here's this place that I've been dreaming of going, and shit, it's only gonna cost me 300 bucks to get there. And I, if I go on VRBO, I can stay in a, you know, a private room in somebody's house for 150 bucks for the week. What's holding you back? 450 bucks to go spend a week in the place that you really wanna go, that you might wanna live, that you could fund on a website that you could put together in a weekend or an afternoon? Don't let that stop you. Break things down into the smaller bits and pieces, and I think you'll find the big, the big obstacle of getting the fuck out and figuring out where it is you want to go and what you want to do is really just a bunch of small obstacles that are loosely chained together, yeah. and, and they're pretty easy to tear apart. Yeah. So uh, with that, we'll take some questions for a couple of minutes until uh, you know, the next speaker is ready to go. Yep. So in our industry, quite a number of people are rather introverted. Sure. Days. That I can see being a serious stumbling block to a lot of the things you suggested. Um, how would you go about having people who have those problems uh, cope with them if they wanted to move in this lifestyle? I'm actually a, an introvert myself, so you, you've got to take it in small steps, break it down, kind of systematically. And for each person, I think it's different, right? What are you comfortable doing? Like, if you're hanging, com comfortable hanging out with folks like this uh, in a place like this. Maybe you go do that, and maybe you stretch your boundaries a little bit more. Um, but I think you've got to you've got to figure that out for yourself a little bit, and make your lifestyle around that. Right? I think it's, it's partly about where you go too. I mean, and just by way of example, like the, the the place that I went to where I had this epiphany and said, "Holy shit, I want to live here." I can tell you, I, I I know for a fact that I could go there, and as long as I wanted to. I could avoid actually talking to anybody else except using the words like cerveza and guacamole, and I could get by comfortably for years that way. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not quite as much of an introvert, but I mean, there are a lot of places where you can go, and frankly, you can be as private or as public as you want to, and, and still be accepted, still be able to to exist within a lot of these communities. And and I, I would also add to that. Um, 
if you, if you seek out a little bit of the expat communities in the place you want to go, I think in a similar manner, you'll find a lot of introverts there who are you know, willing to get together and kind of share tips and secrets about living in places without having to change your whole social dynamic. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think you had a question too, and then we'll turn it over to the next speaker who's coming up. Absolutely. Um, some of the places that you've been mentioning are places that are uh, cheaper to live. Um, my idea that I want to do would be to live in southern hemisphere part of the year, northern hemisphere the other part of the year, and never have to experience winter again. Right. I'm from Canada. Um, I'd like to be in, um, and I'd like to be in um, New Zealand, which is yep. not a cheap place to live. Sure. So you know, when I look at this, I go, yeah, and it's like, wait. So, well, so figure it out. I mean, right. Break it down. Like, what is it going to take? We can take this into the Q&A room, too, but I'll point this out. You're right, because I've looked at New Zealand, too. New Zealand looks freaking amazing, and I haven't been there yet. What's expensive is getting to New Zealand. But, you know, when you get to New Zealand, if you buy a cheap used RV, which you can probably get for under 10 k on most of, of the southern islands, you can travel around and stay in an RV in the parks for almost unlimited periods of time without paying hookup fees, without paying overnight fees. I mean, it's a difference in lifestyle. It's not the same as having a big house on a lot in a gated community or a suburb, but that is to say that, you know, yes, our notion, my notion of New Zealand is expensive if I go do in New Zealand what I've done in Atlanta. But if I want to go to some place like New Zealand, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to figure out what I want to do, and I'm going to go hiking and live in an RV and rent somebody's house. And like, like Bo and I talked about, Opportunity radar, I'm gonna wait until I hear somebody at the coffee shop talking about how they wish they had Wi-Fi and ding, 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 you got an extra bedroom? I bet we can probably hook you up with Wi-Fi. So it, it's just about looking around and finding the opportunities to, to, to kind of, it, it's rethinking things yeah. in a lot of regards. Yeah. So it, due respect for whoever is speaking next, I think we should, uh, we should wrap this up, but I'm happy to, to dialogue more and hear about what you guys want to do and. And, and even sit in the other room, in the Q&A room, I'll sit with a laptop and I will figure out how much it costs and I will help you plan out how to get there if that's what you want to do because it's fucking amazing and liberating and uh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than where I am today. Podcast. Yep. Yeah. Podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're so, doing a podcast. Yeah. Podcast plug. Uh, yeah. GTFoutcast.com. Right now it's a placeholder, but um, we've actually dialogued on this a number of times. Uh, we've done it in the Google Hangout. There's some videos on YouTube. They will all be collected and posted at GTF Outcast, but we also hope to continue this conversation on a regular basis uh, into the foreseeable future. Now it's time for us to GTF go here. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, everybody.